Hello folks, this is Darren Fredrickson. I'm the co-author of the second and third edition of the Fundamentals of Physical Surveillance and some other uh, law enforcement type books. I'm also the creator of the Master Surveillance Training Program, which has been in existence for about 10 years. I train federal, state, and local law enforcement, as well as uh, numerous private sector organizations, uh, retail, organized retail crime teams, investigators. Um, I have about 25 years of experience in the public and private sector doing various types of surveillance investigations. I spent eight years in drug enforcement, working street level narcotics, working some drug trafficking, drug manufacturing, drug organizational surveillance, uh, some pretty, pretty big cases, some pretty sophisticated cases, and also down to the street level crack dealer who's selling crack out of his out of his mouth. Uh, I also worked on the Homicide Drug Task Force for uh, about half a year working homicide suspects that were involved in drug trafficking. Uh, it was a red rum unit, red rum being murder backwards. Uh, then I went to uh, the Repeat Offender Program Surveillance Team, which is uh, it's an elite surveillance team which targets the the baddest of the bad, the career criminals, serial predators. Uh, we work some human trafficking, gun trafficking cases, uh, some homicide cases, and I spent my last eight years in the public sector working, working those type of surveillance cases: burglars, carjackers, purse snatchers, uh, you name it. It uh, got a really good experience. Worked on a on a team of eight, and uh, so. I transitioned from a team of eight to basically a team of one and so we're going to talk about fundamentals of physical surveillance because it all begins with the fundamentals of physically surveilling somebody it's an art there's technology technology is great technology supports a physical surveillance it's you can't rely totally on technology and uh, and we're kind of definitely going the way of technology but it's still we need to have the physical surveillance aspect of it. So what prompted this is I've been wanting to do this. I've had the channel on YouTube for a number of years. Um, I have a, have a Facebook group for a number of years and uh, I just haven't had a lot of time to put it out. And you know, I'm the type of person that wants to get everything lined up, ready to go, extremely professional looking. And um, I'm, I'm not getting to that point because I just don't have time. I work cases all over the country, uh, from east to west, north to south. I've been all over the country doing surveillance in multiple states, sometimes crossing over into other states. So the time factor has become an issue. So I'm out on a surveillance right now in an undisclosed location where it's hot. That's why I'm wearing a tank top. And uh, I'm out here because of a situation where surveillance was compromised, and I'm out here basically to assume the investigation and the surveillance and when I found out how the surveillance was compromised the positioning of the surveillance investigator um, I don't understand it I, I don't understand why a person would position themselves as they did because it it was unnecessary I'm able to do a video here and also as you notice I, I'm still watching for my subject to leave and uh, if I all of a sudden have to leave then I'm done I'm good I'll go with my subject but uh, the, the situation that happened this week was, uh, was unnecessary. And, and what I'm going to do is, through some of this, this training and these tips and all that, I, I can't tell you specifics of what type of case I'm working or where I'm actually at, but I'm going to lay out the scenarios to some degree and the positioning and the neighborhoods and the vehicles. And um, I use about 100% rental vehicles and there's a lot of considerations to be made in what kind of rental vehicle you get. And uh, so I'm going to go through and, and uh, offer you what I can in my last 25 years of experience and how to do surveillance physically. And then at some point technically we'll bring in the technical aspect of it, um, as, it as it comes and goes. The other thing is, is I'm really down to earth. Um, I am I'm a very informal person. I believe in formal education, but 
there's book smarts and there's street smarts and uh, if you have both you can become a master surveillant and that's why I call it master surveillant you got to take both of it you got to take book learning studying learning the art learning the skills learning the strategies and techniques and then actually apply them in the field and that's the street part of it do you have the street smarts uh, I did surveillance in South Chicago uh, January of 2016 was the was the deadliest month of homicides in South Chicago. I didn't know that till I left that it was that deadly. I knew I was in a bad environment. Me being a white male, being in a predominantly African American neighborhood, uh, positioning was the most important aspect of that surveillance. I, I how do I blend in? I, how do I blend into a neighborhood being who I am? Um, I have a vehicle that I use as cover. I have positioning that provides distance and limits the exposure of my target and I was able to watch my target and feel safe and comfortable in that environment even though law enforcement told me I should have a vest on and be packing a gun because that's a bad neighborhood. So whether it's a nice neighborhood or a bad neighborhood we're going to look at some of those aspects and really fundamentally what surveillance comes down to is blending into your environment being as invisible as you can blending in so that you don't draw any attention to yourself and then the psychology of surveillance what do bad guys and girls or people under surveillance how does their mind work are they a career criminal like I did a surveillance a couple weeks ago on a, on a guy on parole who was very vigilant, very aggressive, looking in cars, doing counter surveillance, uh, brought me back to my days of working career criminals, which I've, I've been out of the public sector for five years now, doing private cases for five years. That brought me right back into that element of this guy is vigilant, you gotta give him room. Do you risk taking a burn or do you give him room and pick up on him later? Uh, we're gonna talk about all those aspects. But that guy was doing a lot of counter surveillance. So very, very vigilant down to you got a 65 year old grandma who's got some insurance claim and you're following around to see if she can bend over or reach high or put her elbow or shoulder in a certain position or can she do this can she do that um, those are a lot easier to do because they're not looking for law enforcement or for a surveillance operative necessarily so what we're going to do and uh, some of these tips is we're going to go over surveillance strategies and I hope you subscribe I, I might not ever get a banner on here so subscribe or if this is on my Facebook page uh, follow along and um, follow along here or YouTube but we're going to go over some of the stationary or static surveillance positioning where really is is where it starts is how, how are you positioned in on a static surveillance and able to transition into a mobile surveillance um, like I mentioned I was on a team of eight where you had the luxury of aircraft and tracking and um, you had the availability to have a 24 unit or 24 person surveillance team I operated on an eight person surveillance team and you had an eye you had exits covered and it was it was real fluid moved really well it almost became second nature it wasn't real stressful because you had the resources when you go from eight to one or two, anxiety goes up, stress level goes up, creativity has to go up because you got to function as a solo investigator or maybe having another partner. It's usually one. It's usually a solo investigator, so you got to adapt and you got to change how you how you do your surveillances. And those of you in the private sector are well aware of the one and two person surveillances. Most of you are very familiar with the one person surveillance. Uh, in law enforcement, though. If you're in law enforcement and you're watching this, you can still learn because a lot of times you're going to be in positions where it's one or two of you. On our rope team, we had four, four basically four sets of two partners, right? And we would all go out on our on our targets, and so we'd have two, 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 two. Whoever moved first, if the target looked like they were gonna they were casing, they were gonna go active, then the whole team came over. But other than that, you operated as a two-person team to get intelligence, to watch a target, to basically say, yep, they're, uh, it's game on, they're ready to go, they're looking like they're gonna do a crime, and then everybody mobilize on that, on that target. But you operate as one or two in the meantime. 
So we're going to go over stationary static positioning and then also mobile vehicle surveillance, bicycle surveillance. I've done numerous bicycle surveillances on some of the serial predators we worked where they were hitting certain apartment complexes. We were on foot watching, looking, looking for the predator. And uh, that's where you change your communication strategies with, commu with being on a bicycle. You don't have all the resources you do when you're in a vehicle. So you have to put stuff in backpacks and go hands-free with a lot of your uh, communication or your comms. Then we're going to look at foot surveillance. Rural, urban foot surveillance. In, I, I have not worked downtown New York where it's all public transportation and foot surveillance for, for the most sense. Um, and that's just because I, I haven't operated in that environment. I've done a, extensive foot surveillance though. So you basically take the fundamentals of the strategies of foot surveillance and then you can apply it anywhere. So um, in a dense urban environment though, where there's public transportation, you do have issues with communications with subways, trains, and uh, and those types of issues. Then we're going to talk about some technology. Technology is great. Uh, I, I use I use a, a whole bunch of different types of optics cameras uh, primarily. Um, I've become a very big fan of the the GoPro Session 4, which can be concealed in any number of items, and I get a lot of my video off of uh, my foot surveillance videos all off the of GoPro. Then I have just a standard camcorder, a monopod, things like that. And the GoPro I conceal in different items, sports bottle, uh, packaging, depending on what kind of surveillance I'm doing, I can conceal it. I can stream it to my phone if I need to watch it. But a lot of times with a GoPro, you have a 180 degree high definition video window. So as long as you got that camera pointing in the right direction, you're gonna get what you need to get on foot surveillance. And then optics. What are you doing on surveillance? You're watching primarily. You're out there watching. So if you don't invest in a good pair of binoculars, these are my travel binoculars. Uh, they're still, I think they're, uh, I think they're about 600 bucks or so. They're Zeiss, uh, but they do a good job during the daytime. And they, being I travel a lot, they travel, they pack well. Um, I have a bigger pair of Zeiss that I, that I'll break out if I need them. But this really does the job, right here for the most part. If you're watching and you're not, if, if your job is to watch and get intelligence or maybe video, invest the money in a pair of binoculars that'll get you more information and more intelligence. Kind of a no-brainer, but I still, I like I said, I do law enforcement training, private sector training. I still see some of the binoculars that people break out, like the little sports ones. Um, that, that can work in a daylight setting, but again, if you're truly a surveillance operative, you need to invest the money and get something that is going to enhance your vision. And then we'll talk about videos as things go on. So uh, I look forward to giving you the insight of 25 years of experience doing covert physical surveillance. I'm going to tell you things that have worked, things that have not worked, times have been compromised. Um, I check my ego at the door. If you're in surveillance, you're going to get burned at some point, most likely. What you're trying to do is minimize those burns. Burn meaning compromise, exposure. And then sometimes you think you're burned, but you're not burned. And we're going to talk about that too. There's that whole psychology thing going on where you think that they're doing counter surveillance and they're just lost. Or they curb it and you think, oh, they're curbing it, they're looking for me, they're lost. And usually 90% of the time, they're lost. And that's why once you start looking at, are they doing counter surveillance on me? Are they vigilant? Are they doing things that lead me to believe they're, they've identified me or they're looking for me? Then that's when you gotta take certain actions to uh, either identify that or to, to back off and figure out another plan. So, like I said, um, I've been meaning to do this for a long time. Time has been of concern. I usually like to go professional as professional as I can and uh, the it's just been it's been slow going and I'd rather get the information out there now and help people because like I said this incident this week here is uh, totally uncalled for 
And I think maybe what I'll do is this will be the first scenario I discuss is the positioning of the surveillance investigator and how I positioned where I'm able to not get burned within two hours. I'm in a position where I feel totally comfortable. I'm going to see him long before he'll ever see me and I can take steps to engage in a one person surveillance on him. So I look forward to getting to know you. If you have any comments, please comment below. Other than that, we'll see what happens. See where I, uh, I'm going to California this week on a surveillance. Uh, I guess I shouldn't have said that, but I guess you don't know when I necessarily put this out. I'll try to keep my locations, unless it's not compromising anything. Um, I'll, I'll let you know where I'm at. All right, thanks. Take care and be safe.